Palm Sunday. Uh, we're so glad that you are here. Uh, we have a special uh, work with our children and youth today. Uh, so uh, as they will come in and wave the palms, they'll go around the sanctuary. If you're sitting on the edge of the pew, need to watch your face and your eyes. You don't want to get your eye poked out with the palm branches as they're coming by. But uh, let's stand now, if we will, please, for the prelude. much you may be seated let's give our children a round of applause it is a great job all right I can't remember the last time I got to uh Lead a bunch of children in something. And palm branches too. As good as they did it, you, you might have thought that they had been there some 2,000 years ago. Allow me to say welcome to everyone here as we rejoice it being Palm Sunday. And that means we're just one week away from Easter Sunday. How exciting that will be. Our church uh, week is going to be full of things that I hope we will see you here for. Thursday evening at 6 p.m., we're going to meet here for our Monday Thursday service. And communion will be involved. It's a short service. You who have been here before know how meaningful it is. So I hope that you will make plans to be here. And at 7 o'clock in the morning on Easter Sunday, we will be down on the side of the fellowship hall for our sunrise service. And I hope that you can make it there. We think that the weather is going to be kind to us. So I hope you'll come. And then the bonus 
is a wonderful breakfast that will be prepared for us. So come hungry for the word and come hungry for the breakfast to follow. And at 11 o'clock, I can hardly contain myself, when we have our Easter Sunday service, you will be singing congregationally. That's right, you'll be singing through your masks, but it's not just my voice that's going to be heard that day. It's going to be your voices. And that is something to get excited about. If you were in my shoes, you'd be a lot more excited than some of you are looking right now. But you've got this week to practice your singing voice and get it back together. Whether you are a virtuoso or you can't carry a tune in a bucket, Ken Simmons, I'm looking your way. But do your best because we want all voices to be heard on that day as we celebrate Easter Sunday. The office will be closed Friday. Teresa will be on vacation. Read your bulletin. Read your newsletter as it comes. There's some things in there that pertain to you and folks you know and folks you don't know. Oh, the egg hunt. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Dave. We got something for all the kids and the parents and the well-wisher and looker honors. Saturday at 10 o'clock, rain or shine, you be in the fellowship hall at 10 o'clock. We're going to start with the craft. The eggs are going to be hidden out on the lawn, some to be found in June by Mr. Doug. But we want you to be here because it's going to be fun. Dave is going to share the Easter story, and he does it in such a wonderful way. So you don't want to miss that, and we're going to have a hot dog lunch with everything that goes with it. Wonderful way to kick off your Saturday be here, and I can assure you that we will start taking steps once again to do things as we used to do them, and we want to do it with the children. So I'll be looking for you, all right? And you be looking for those eggs and get them all. This morning, our scripture comes from the biggest book in the Bible, the book of Psalms, and I'll be reading just a few verses from Psalm 118, beginning with verses 1 and 2, and then jumping to verses 26 and to 29. Hear these words. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, His love endures forever. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and He has made His light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. May God add his blessings to the reading as we go to him now in prayer. Most gracious Lord, we celebrate this day just one week away from Easter Sunday, and we remember what we read of how wonderful it was and how the people praised you as you entered into Jerusalem. And as the days went on, Things changed. They got worse, but they did so so we could have everything better. We thank you, God, for the gift of your Son. And through Him, we have eternal life. May, may we be reminded of that as we go through this service and praise you and hear your instruction and pray. These things we ask in your name. Amen the children to come down for our children's moments at this time. Great, come on down. So good to see you all. We've got some more coming down from up top. Yeah. on down I can just have a seat right up here there we go that every no there's one more come on down there we go turn around and look at me I'm right behind you <laughs> it's good to see you all this morning Thank you for coming. I look like everybody here just about helped come in and wave the palms, and we certainly appreciate that because 
Uh, that's something that we do on a Sunday called Palm Sunday. Uh, and have you ever wondered why we wave palms? You know, the first of uh, the Bible tells us that uh, when Jesus came into the city there, that all the people heard he was coming. And so they went and they tore branches off the palm tree. This is a palm tree right here. Uh, Anthony might have one up on the screen for everybody else, but here's a palm tree. And uh, so they tore branches off and they laid them down in front of him as he walked in. Now, why in the world would they do that? He was riding on a donkey. Uh huh. Why do you think they did that? You are so right. I hope uh, everybody should have heard that. She said whenever a king or a prince would go into a new town, a place where they hadn't been before, the people would tear uh, palm branches down and lay them down and wave them because they were welcoming in royalty. Yes, Johnson? No, no, and, G and it says it was palm branches, and they actually, some of them took their coats off and laid them down as well. And they did that because they were wanting to honor Jesus as a king. But now, why in the world would you think a palm tree would remind people of, of a king? You know, most trees that you've got, they've got branches that grow out. You can crawl up in a branch, climb the tree. But what the, the branches on a palm tree are all at the top. And in fact, this is called the crown of the palm tree. Who wears crowns? Kings and queens. That's right. And so when they pull these branches off and wave them, they were in effect saying, you are the king. In fact, you are our king. We want you to be the king. But we know that Jesus didn't want to be a king the way that they wanted him to be a king. In fact, folks have taken palm branches like these right here and they weave them into a cross because that's the kind of king that Jesus was. He came and gave his life on the cross so that he could be not the king of a country or the king of a nation or even the king of the world. He's the king of our hearts. And that's what makes a difference. So when we think about Jesus being king, we want him to be the king of our hearts. Let's take a moment and thank him, okay? Dear Lord, we thank you so much that you love us. We thank you for each of these children. And Lord, we pray that you would help us all to allow you to truly be the king of our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I've got a, cross, uh, a palm cross for you over there as well as some candy. So if you'd take a cross and a piece of candy, and then you can go with Dave and uh, the others that are going for our children's worship. Thank you so much. Come to the time now of our offering our pastoral prayer. Would encourage you to look uh, through the uh, bulletin on the uh, prayer list for the folks that we know of that have special needs there. And I uh, would particularly call your attention to Edwin Stevens, who is on our list, and uh, also my father, as he's had a, a bit of a, a rough week uh, health wise. Are there others that you would share with us at this time that? Uh, or uh, that, that uh, we would like to pray for. Okay, thank you so much. Any others? Any unspoken, if you would raise your hand, that way we would certainly recognize that as we normally do, and thank you so much. We know many people do. Let's go to, a, to the Lord for a moment of prayer. On this Palm Sunday, dear Lord, we remember how you rode over the cloaks and the waving of the branches, riding through the shouts of, of praises, 
receiving praise that you truly deserve, but not confusing the false praise for fulfilling your purpose. Lord, we remember how you rode toward the controversy, toward the suffering and toward the cross, toward, toward the, cro the curses and the pain, receiving stripes you didn't deserve to give us a reward that we could never earn. Lord, we remember how you rode through the tomb and the grave, through our time and space, ascending to a throne that will never decay, giving us a life of love and peace. We thank you, Lord, as we remember the journey you've taken, and we commit ourselves to walking in the journey that you have laid out for us in the same way. Lord, we pray that you give us strength and hope and joy and perseverance as we seek to follow, faithfully follow you. And Lord, this day as always, remember those in our church, in our community, and in our world who find themselves on difficult places in their journey, in their lives today. Lord, we pray that they would find your presence, receive your gifts of healing and wholeness and forgiveness in exactly what they need in accordance to your divine will. And we pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Uh, I want to welcome everyone here this morning. Uh, it's a beautiful time of year. It's my favorite time of year. We're coming up on Easter. And um, when Dave asked me to sing, I, I, this song is just means a lot to me, but it gets me excited because when I think about Easter and Palm Sunday and Jesus coming into this new season, it reminds me of some of the characters of Easter. Um, unfortunately, in my life, sometimes I look more like a Barabbas than I do anyone else in this story, but um, it just tells me, I think of the guy on the cross, the thief on the cross that was just hanging there. He was hung just like Jesus was, and he was dying, and, and he was ashamed of his sin, and, and all he did was ask Jesus, remember me when you get into your kingdom, and uh, it's just that simple. He loves us just that much, so when you hear the words of this song, let it sink in and just know that you can always just come as you are. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, whole oh sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrow, the heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow, the heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. And all who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wanderer, come home, you're not too far. Lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are. There's hope for the hopeless and all those who stray. Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow, the heaven can't cure. So lay down 
your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Thank you so much, Anthony, for that uh, reminder of the truth and the power of the gospel. Come to that time in our service where we recognize the uh, giving of our gifts. Uh, so it's uh, through the week. Uh, so many have uh, sent in their offerings, and we certainly appreciate that, as well as those of you who have brought your gifts as well. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we are grateful that as we come into your presence, we do so as a result of your invitation. We have received the gift of life through the gift of faith. And now, Lord, as a part of our growth toward Christian maturity, we return to you a portion of what you have entrusted to our care from our finances, praying, Lord, that you would bless each gift for the building of your kingdom in your world and in our lives. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Our scripture text this morning is a familiar passage of scripture, obviously on Palm Sunday. Mark 11, verses 1 through 11. Mark 11, 1 through 11. Let's stand together in honor of the reading of God's written word. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went out and found the cold outside in the street tied to a doorway. And as they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus told them to and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. And those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. 
Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple courts, looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. May the Lord bless to our hearts and to our minds this portion of God's written word today. Thank you so much. You may be seated. A few years ago, one of my favorite devotional guides, Our Daily Bread, carried the story of a pastor who was also a traveling evangelist who rode a donkey uh, for, as he traveled from village to village in the rough areas of Brazil, uh, preaching the gospel. One day, the evangelist fell asleep in the saddle as he made his return home after a long and tiring day. A couple of hours later, he was rudely awakened as the ride got rough. His donkey had left the trail and was walking through a rocky field. At first, the evangelist was angry, but he calmed down when he saw that they were almost back to the village, much quicker than the road would normally take them. And when he arrived at his church, the pastor learned that his congregation was there and they were praying hard for his safety. They had learned that a rancher who was opposed to the Christian faith had sent some men out to attack the evangelist on sort of a blind bend in the trail. And they thanked God for causing the donkey to take a shortcut home that avoided the place of the ambush. We ask ourselves when we hear things like that, was that God's uh, protection? I believe that it probably was uh, protecting uh, this evangelist through the good sense of a donkey. Uh, Donkeys are interesting and they have a a colorful history, a a dubious reputation. Of course, their reputation is uh, kind of like Baptist, uh, stubborn. Uh, It's said that they considerably more difficult to force or frighten a donkey into doing something that it perceives to be dangerous than, say, a horse. And they say it's because the donkey doesn't really have uh, feelings of connection to its owners the way that the horse does. The donkey just looks out for himself. And, of course, that stubbornness of a donkey is said to have saved the life of one Old Testament uh, prophet, uh, certainly one of the less glamorous prophets, a prophet by the name of Balaam. Uh, His donkey miraculously spoke to him uh, as he was a disobedient, money-hungry prophet. Uh, And it's uh, not one of the the prettiest stories in the Old Testament. Uh, If you remember there in Numbers 22, uh, the Lord is angry at Balaam for not being obedient. And Balaam is trying to go with some Moabite officials against what the Lord has told him to do. And the Lord uh, puts a, uh, an angel to stand in Balaam's way. And Balaam was so disconnected to God that he didn't even see the angel, but the donkey did. The angel standing in the road with a drawn sword in its hand, so the donkey turned off the road into the field. And this made Balaam furious, and so he beat his donkey to try and get him to go back on the road. And again, the angel stood in Balaam's way on a narrow path with walls on both sides. And when the donkey saw the angel, it pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it. And clueless again, Balaam beat his donkey once again. Then the angel moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angels, it just simply sat down, laid down, And again, Balaam was angry, and he beat the donkey with his staff. And then, according to the story, the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and the donkey said to Balaam, What have I done to you to make you beat me three times? Balaam doesn't seem to be surprised at all to hear the donkey talk. In fact, he answered the donkey. He said, You've made a fool of me. If I only had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. And the incredulous donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, Balaam had to admit. And in that moment, the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed his head low and fell face down and repented. Why have you beaten your donkey three times? I have come here to oppose you because you are on a reckless path. The donkey saw me, and fortunately for you, it turned off the path each time. If it had not turned away, I would have certainly killed you by now, but I, uh, but I have spared it. And Balaam said to the angel, I have sinned. 
I did not realize you were blocking me. If you are displeased, I will go back. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. And Balaam did that obediently. Those are some of those stories that we find in the Old Testament that, that speak to uh, obedience and disobedience and the, uh, really in some ways the grace of God, not just simply zapping the sinner in the moment, but giving even a disobedient, self-centered, greedy prophet a second chance, really a third chance uh, to uh, hear and respond. In uh, preparing for today, I did a little more research than usual on donkeys. That's not something that I generally think about. But I came across some interesting facts. Do you know that more people uh, around the world are killed by donkeys each year than die in plane crashes? I don't know what you'll do with that information. Just uh, if you happen to come across a donkey, be careful. Uh, they're, they're not, they're not uh, small, tame pets. Uh, they've been used as working animals at least 5,000 years. There are more than 40 million donkeys in the world, mostly in underdeveloped countries uh, where they're principally used as pack animals. But working donkeys are often found in, in most of the time in poor areas where the folks live near or below the poverty level. And some number of donkeys are kept for breeding as pets and things like that. But in spite of their reputation, donkeys really are intelligent and cautious. Uh, they can be friendly uh, and eager to learn. And of course, uh, if you love Eddie Murphy, you know that he knows all about donkeys as he was Shrek uh, in, the, in the movies there. But when we think about the donkey, the donkey does sort of play a supporting role uh, in Palm Sunday. Uh, and in fact, uh, it is a sort of a primary role uh, because it was a fulfillment of what the prophet Zechariah had said about the Messiah. That one day, uh, Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And that is exactly what happened. To get to the heart of Palm Sunday, it is indeed an account of true greatness. And the story has three movements to it. It was a humble entry, but it was a powerful announcement. And it was an announcement for us all. It was a humble entry. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples in to go and scout out the colt, which is another word for a donkey, and was brought to the Lord uh, for him to ride. He didn't even have a donkey, the poor form of transportation, yet he borrowed one from someone else. Certainly not the way, not the way that a rich and powerful person would enter into, the, enter into, the, in, uh, into Jerusalem. But yet the people recognized who Jesus was. This was the culmination of his three years of ministry, performing miracles around the countryside, uh, his reputation going to places where he had physically not able, uh, been able to go. And as uh, the, the, the feast of the Passover, the religious fervor that was taking place there in the city of Jerusalem, uh, and they heard that Jesus was on the way, they thought, yes, this must be uh, a fulfillment of what Zechariah has said, that our Messiah is coming riding on a colt on the foal of a donkey. And so they did and treated him like a king, tearing branches off the palm trees and laying their coats in front of them and shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Certainly it is a beautiful story, but when we think about it, it really truly is a story of humility because on the other side of the city, Pilate was entering and Pilate entered in the great Roman way of uh, those who would come in to show their dominance. He came in riding a, a great stallion. He was preceded by his troops who were armed in their armor that was gleaming uh, there in the sun, of their swords and their shields, and uh, marching into the, uh, to, uh, in cadence, uh, certainly announcing that someone important was coming into town, whereas on the other side, the common people were shouting and welcoming Jesus, the humble son of a carpenter. 
Pilate was surrounded by a security force of Roman soldiers bearing swords and shields and heavy armor. Jesus came in unarmed among the peasants with his followers who were sort of a ragtag group that were made up of various people from various strata of society. Yes, Pilate's soldiers sneered at the people that were there and Jesus turned and embraced the common people, not trying to scare them or impress them, simply embracing what they were saying as true, that he was blessed, that he was coming in the name of the Lord. No greater contrast could be seen that day between the kingdom of this world and its political power and brute force and the gentle, peaceful arrival of Jesus Christ, God's only Son. And yet, more than 2,000 years later, the only reason we know Pontius Pilate's name is that he's written about in the New Testament. And those who say the creed, the Apostles' Creed particularly says, has the line in there that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. But certainly, it was Jesus, the humble servant, the humble uh, servant of God, who held the day. Because true humility is a beautiful thing to see. An Indian evangelist, Sundar Singh, had just completed a tour around the world and God had used and blessed his ministry everywhere that he went. And while he was in Europe, someone uh, evidently wanting to bring him down a peg asked him, said, "Uh, doesn't getting so much honor cause you to wonder if it's doing you harm? And Sundar Singh said, no, the donkey went into Jerusalem and they put garments on the ground in front of the donkey. This donkey was not proud. He knew that what was being said and done was not to honor him, but for Jesus who was sitting on his back. And in the same way I know when people honor me, it is not me, but the Lord that they are honoring, who I am simply a humble servant for. He certainly was a humble man. Just as his Lord came with humility that first Palm Sunday, true humility is always something that shines uh, brightly in any area of our world. Pastor Dan Bentz tells of a vacation time in Florida uh, back uh, when Bill Clinton was president and he was flying in to look at the devastation of some tornadoes that had come in during the spring of that year. And he said it just so happened that the plane as it was coming in flew in at a very low altitude right over the home where Bentz and his family were renting and everybody heard what was going on and they stepped outside and they looked up and, and the, uh, the, the planes were so low that uh, they could almost see and make out the people inside but clearly they could make out the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the image that was emblazoned on the side of the plane that it was Air Force One that the President of the United States was flying uh, in to see the damage and survey of what had taken place. But he says as impressive as that huge plane was, what was even more impressive was the several small fighter jets armed to the teeth that were flying in front of, beside, over, and behind the President's plane. You could not help but know, if you didn't know anything at all, that somebody important was on that plane. When Jesus came into uh, Jerusalem, there was no such preparation for his coming. Uh, There was no royal chariot, only a borrowed donkey. Jesus came with humility. But it was the prelude to a powerful announcement. And it was clear that he was announcing to the world symbolically that he was indeed the Messiah. That's why the religious authorities were stirred up with such hatred toward him. They too knew Zechariah's prophecy. They knew that some of the people who were welcoming him that day in Jerusalem were hoping that he would indeed be the one that would deliver them. Not only was that a threat to the religious establishment, they knew that if he garnered much of a following, that would bring down the might of the Roman Empire upon them fiercely. He was a threat to the established order. And so they gathered and potted what they would do with him. Probably they were uh, only spurred on more by the events of Palm Sunday. If someone's noted that a problem with 
uh, the, the palms that were cut down from the palm trees is once you cut the branches from the tree, the tree really doesn't live very long. The problem with Palm Sunday is that the excitement of the crowds also didn't last very long because within a week, many who were in the crowd shouting Hosanna were in the same crowd shouting crucify him. That's the way that popular opinion goes. That's the way mobs can go. Uh, they're fickle. They're unpredictable. Brian LaCroix says a uh, scene in the movie Red River. John Wayne and his men are moving cattle along the Chisholm Trail when the cattle are spooked by howling coyotes. And then one of the men tried to uh, get some sugar and he uh, bumped into the pans on the chuck wagon and knocked all the pans off, making this huge, huge sound. And that's caused the cattle to stampede, killing one of the wranglers that was watching over them. But just before they stampeded, the cattle were tense. The men knew it wouldn't take much to set them off. And that's the way mobs always are, aren't they? They're tense and waiting for the late, slightest provocation to begin destroying whatever's in front of them. The crowd might be defined in some ways as a pre-mob bunch. But they may never turn into a mob, but they can be fickle, wandering around like a bunch of sheep, looking for direction. The crowd of people who cheered Jesus at the triumphal entry were easily swayed just a few days later to turn into the mob that would help crucify him. Yes, Jesus rode in on the donkey, a colt, uh, a foal of a donkey, signaling that he was the Messiah and setting into motion events that were irreversible. Some in the crowd uh, praising him uh, were later grabbed by their shirt collars and sort of coerced into changing their mind immediately. This humble man who sought only to share love and compassion in the world would ultimately die the cruelest of deaths on a cross hanging outside the city gate over the trash dump. It was a death that he refused to avoid. And of course, that's the most amazing thing, isn't it? That he chose to do this for you and for me and for everyone else. And that's a, a difficult thing to try and grasp. Uh, only a God of deep, uh, deep compassion and love would seek to forgive each one of us of our sin. Certainly a lot of people say, I only want what I deserve, uh, but they have no clue what they're talking about. None of us want what we truly deserve because the wages of sin is what? Death. And we're not talking about just dying. We're talking about eternal death, eternal separation from God himself. But it's the gift of God that is, brings eternal life. And so we all understand that the only way that we have any hope in this life is to receive the gift of God's grace something that we could never be worthy enough to receive. University president at a Ivy League school once faced the unpleasant task of having to discipline some students who had been caught vandalizing places on the college campus. One of the young men was uh, uh, who, sort of the spokesman for the group was the son of an extremely wealthy family. In the midst of the scolding by the president of the college, this student sort of jauntily reached into his pocket for a checkbook and with a, a haughty expression said, What are you hassling us for? Why all the fuss? Just tell us what all this cost. I'll gladly pay the bill and more. The president was incensed. He says, Put your checkbook back in your pocket. This, this week in the assembly, you will stand up and make a public acknowledgement of what you have done and then you will all be expelled. Do you think a few miserable dollars can repay a debt to the founders of this university, the sacrifices that they made to build this place and endow it with such great care and high cost? And in his closing statement, he said, Each one of you here, whether you know it or not, is here on the grace and the charity of those who have lived before. The quicker you learn that, the better off you'll be. And certainly that's true for each one of us. We are all here where we are 
simply because we have received the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Jesus was a man of great humility. When he rode into Jerusalem on the colt, the foal of a donkey, he set into motion events that were irreversible. They resulted in his crucifixion and death. But the good news is that he not only did it out of love for you and for me, but the greatest news is that although he died, he did not remain dead. He was resurrected, and that is what we'll gather to celebrate next Sunday morning, the most important, significant event in all the history of the world, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that, because of that, we have the ability not simply to gather in a place, but we gather as children of God. We gather as those who are heirs of eternal life, the life that makes life abundant here during our, uh, the li during our lifetime. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are once again overwhelmed as we try to consider the truth of who you are, the power of your grace. And Lord, we are grateful that Christ was willing to embrace the role of humility, even though he was indeed your son, he was in, and is indeed God, he was willing to take on the role of a humble servant and to give himself as a sacrifice to pay for the sins of all humanity. And Lord, as we gather here this day in this place of worship, we pray uh, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would remind us of, of how you would have us to live in response to the depth of this great eternal truth. And we ask these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. These next moments as uh, uh, Joyce and uh, them play uh, the uh, hymn, uh, There is a Redeemer, uh, we would encourage you to use these moments to reflect upon the, what the, God, uh, the truth of the gospel is in this place and in, your day, in this day and in our lives. stand together for our closing prayer lord as we have worshiped you this day we are thankful for the opportunity to gather in this place 
We're thankful, Lord, for the opportunity to be touched by the truth of what you have shared with us in your written word. And now, Lord, as we go from this place, we pray that you would help us to go uh, filled by your spirit, that we might truly be your disciples in the places of responsibility that you have given us. And we offer this prayer in and through the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you and go in peace.